Welcome everybody. Um, this is Hiring Web3 Talent. Um, just want to let everybody know that this webinar webinar is being recorded, um, but we will definitely send an email out to everybody uh, with the replay. And feel free to submit any uh, questions that you have in the chat, and we'll try to answer them at the end. So I will uh, give this over to Anish, who will be um, kicking things off. Cool. Um, we'll just do a couple quick intros here and then get into some of the questions that folks had asked. So folks who'd RSVP'd, if you remember when you RSVP'd, you asked a question um, at the very bottom of your RSVP. And we sort of cherry picked the most interesting questions to talk to our, our, our experts here uh, about. And really quickly, in my background, used to run growth and marketing for different companies and then started an executive recruiting firm. Um, now we're a team of 14. Uh, working on senior level roles for a wide variety of companies. Uh, yeah, if you want to introduce yourself, Courtney, <laughs> yeah, since we, <laughs> you don't have to feel, you don't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Um, I, as it says here, I'm a self proclaimed people person. It's one of my best traits, I feel, um, and care a lot about the, the people aspect and the people function in any organization. Um, really honed in on that over the last 10 years, um, and I've just found a place here in Web3. I've been in Web3 almost two years. Really exciting. You'll hear in a little bit, probably how I accidentally joined Web3, um, but have a background in, in government contracts and then just traditional tech as well. I am a transplant back home to Michigan. Um, and when I am not talking about uh, best practices or building culture or remote first workplaces, I am out um, in the great outdoors in Michigan with my two kids and husband. Amazing. Hey everyone, I'm Jordan Freed. Uh, I run a blockchain holding company called Immutable Holdings. Um, and our vision and mission is really to um, uh, help increase awareness, access, and adoption of Web3 technologies like blockchain, um, and then build businesses that help do all those things. So we have some diversified holdings. It's pretty exciting. Uh, before this, I've started several companies at this point. Um, I was part of the founding team of a layer one blockchain protocol called Hedera Hashgraph. Uh, with the associated token called HBAR. Um, and then I started a popular uh, SaaS VPN uh, company called Buffered VPN, where uh, we were one of the earliest consumer software companies to actually start taking Bitcoin as a payment method back in 2013. Um, so that's me. Awesome. And I think out of everyone here, you've been kind of in the Web3 game for the longest. So when did you sort of, sort of start wor working on products or anything within the space? Yeah, I've always been very product oriented in the sense that uh, I kind of had the great fortune of growing up with uh, motherboards at the breakfast table. Uh, okay. My dad's an absolute tech nerd. Uh, so what I lack in formal education, you'll notice there's no mention of the school in my bio, and that's because I didn't go to one. Um, <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> I, I gained uh, really just firsthand experience in uh, we were building modems at home. We had static electricity strips all over our basement um, to, to build the machines. Um, you know, grew up with DOS operating systems. So uh, I had the fortune of actually discovering it early. It was while running Buffered VPN that our users, all thanks to the Buffered VPN customers, um, that requested Bitcoin as a payment method. My response was, what the heck is this? I had heard of Bitcoin, but like, how do you take it? What do you do with it? Um, and I never left the rabbit hole. So I fell into the rabbit hole in 2012 and I'm still very much at the bottom of the rabbit hole. And it's anyone's guess what the other side of this rabbit hole looks like, but it's been a lot of fun. And I've kind of dedicated my entire career to figuring out what we can now do with crypto and blockchain tech. It's amazing, a decade in the game. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Erin, Global Talent Lead here at Coindesk. Um, we aim to be the most trusted and influential platform for the emerging uh, crypto economies. Um, happy to be here and happy to talk about Web3 metaverse recruiting. Um, and Anish, thank you for the invite. Absolutely. Thanks for coming here. Of course. Great. Um, we'll get started with some of the the uh, audience questions here. If we can uh, jump on to the next slide. So 
Looks like we got some tech difficulties here. Um, sorry. But I know one of the questions that is up there is someone asked an interesting question about, you know, have you ever utilized either tokens or any of your, your currency to actually pay employees considering that you have an alternative? I mean, not, not every company in Web3 has an alternative currency there to offer up, but those of you who do, and, and I was kind of curious, I didn't know whether that's kind of something that, that, that folks had done. Uh, and had you heard of that kind of happening or, or anything like that? I guess Jordan, since you sort of were earlier in it, like, have sure. you ever sort of sort of used tokens or anything like that <clears throat> as kind of compensation? Yeah, uh, it, at several different points throughout uh, the various different businesses I've been involved in, we've uh, we've used it. So in the earliest days of Bitcoin, the I think some of the most exciting people in our space opted to get paid in it. Uh, once I think the sort of evolution of it is, you learn about it, you read the white paper. Everyone has their uh, I think the everyone's favorite game to play at like a crypto conference is okay how did you first hear about bitcoin when were you first exposed to these ideas of bitcoin and now it's not even bitcoin a lot of people are first exposed to like ethereum or solana so they have very different paths but back in the day it was like okay how did we all first hear about it and those that had the light bulb earliest were vitalik was among them vitalik people don't like remember, but Vitalik literally earned one to four Bitcoin for actually writing articles for an early Bitcoin publication. I think it was Bitcoin Magazine that he was originally writing for. Similarly, some of our engineers um, asked us in the very early days of building Buffered VPN, asked to you know uh, take some exposure to it for us to pay them. Uh, when I left Hedera and I started making early stage investments and we started Hedera Hashgraph, one of the big value propositions of Hedera was to be early to a new layer one protocol, being early to like an Ethereum or Solana or layer one protocol. These ecosystems kind of drive around um, an economy. If you look at cryptocurrency, I think the key part of that word is currency and currency kind of implies an economy. Mm -hmm. And the great utility of like ETH is you need it to execute smart contracts to consume CPU bandwidth and storage of these networks. So it has some implied value and the networks that are structured the best have found ways to capture that value in those tokens and those tokens become valuable, typically proportionate to the network effects, you know, the net number of users or developers in those ecosystems. So um, we did uh, pay uh, the earliest employees uh, at Hedera in HBAR um, because we didn't have this concept of equity. There was nothing to take equity exposure to. We don't own the protocol. Um, other companies do. It's decentra It's decentralized. So thus, the only way to take equity is you know own a piece of a protocol, become a stakeholder in the protocol itself. And um, the people that made that decision, I think the proudest thing uh, for me, at least around Hedera, was the people who took the earliest bets on it uh, did very very well. The earliest developers who decided to build applications, uh, in particular, did very very well uh, and continue to even in this market. If you were really early to HBAR, you were able to pick it up below a penny, um, and uh, I think that's one of the great that's one of the great values of being early to these ecosystems. So, oh, this is the exact question I'm supposed to be answering. I just saw you put it up. No, 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 no. We're just having a discussion. These these questions are just kind of like to. To, to yeah. these boilerplates and whatnot, but no, I, I was actually just more curious. And and th those folks who decided to take tokens, um, and it seems like you're saying it did, it did work out well for them. They were happy that they did that. Yeah, I, if you look at wealth creation in crypto in general, I think the yeah. people who have done the best at this point in time were earliest to well-established crypto companies. Like you were an early engineer. Um, Balaji got to Coinbase by being, he was the C, uh, he was the leader of earn.com, sold it to Coinbase, got a lot of Coinbase stock. That's one way, the traditional equity way. The others are you're one of the first 10 engineers at Solana or Hedera or mm -hmm. Avalanche or Algorand, um, or a major token based ecosystem. I mean, even the ones that were bankrupt, if you left at the right time, there were a lot of people that were early to like Celsius and even Voyager that cashed out this past cycle um, and who have moved on to other things. So those are other examples um, of it. But I think the to actually maybe even address this question, the way I'm seeing people do it now, which is very different than how we did it in 2017, but yeah. it seems like the world is kind of standardized on 
when you create the um, when you create a new token based ecosystem, the first thing you want to do is uh, first, I think, decentralize your governance around the issuer of that token. People are going offshore to BVI or Cayman uh, for that particular issuer. You want to get an independent valuation, um, and there's lots of firms that do this. I think Technos is the biggest. You get the independent valuation on the fully diluted token supply, and then you issue all of your earliest team members 83B elections um, to pay the tax at the founding token valuation. So then the tax obligation is already covered with the IRS. The early team members, um, typically your first 20, 30, 40 employees will, you know, who are in that early get that Um uh, and then, uh, you're sort of, you're sort of off to the races. Yeah. The, the earliest people on, on the team, uh, have already covered their tax obligation. And then of course it's, um, you, you're going to have to pay tax on the appreciation of that later. Sure. Um, but that'll be structured more like a, I believe a capital gain. I'm not a financial professional. This is just how I've seen it done for some of the investments <laughs> I've made and how we've structured it in the past. I mean, even getting into into this industry has a heavy risk reward component, right? So some people are just going to be so far on that risk tolerance side and be like, okay, let's pay let's pay me in a very large percentage of tokens as part of my total annual compensation and ride the wave and see what happens. Um, and, and Aaron or Courtney, had, have you sort of come across that at all uh, with people sort of, and even if you're not an organization that issues tokens, sort of saying like, okay, do people want to be paid? in in either like bitcoin or ethereum or anything like that or not so much these days i mean we're um, a protocol company right uh, so sorry Aaron, we're protocol okay. so that's you know really the heart of what we're doing so we definitely offer folks the option to get paid in tokens get paid in fiat okay um, the rules change a little bit um, based on your location, right? If you are a U.S.-based employee, your options are a bit different, obviously. Um, sure. But if you are one of our international folks, we we have a number of options, and and people it depends on your risk tolerance. It's an interesting time to join mm -hmm. a protocol company if you're an international contractor, because right now, um, I, you know, I think we've all said like, you know, cryptocurrencies are on sale, right? So if you're willing yeah. to. Take risk and ride the wave exactly like what you guys were talking about. Um, there are a number of folks who did that. Um, you know, Orton's been around about four years, very early folks, similar to what Jordan's talking about, were, were rewarded handsomely, right? Early last year for their their tolerance and their patience. Um, but we we do offer that. I think our number of folks like that. I think it's one of the things that people enjoy about Web3. It's why you are drawn to Web3 typically, right? If you are mm -hmm. somebody who's um, into the decentralization, right? All of those pieces, um, it really puts a leg up for joining other, other companies. Um, but that's a big thing for us. The tax thing, we do provide a little bit of resources around. I'm also not a tax expert, so I'm not going to <laughs> advice, um, but definitely something that we, we share with folks about, but yeah, a lot of it's the pitch that, um, you know, you said to ride the wave, how much risk tolerance you have. Um, but it's a huge part of what we're doing. Um, and we mm -hmm. don't issue equity, we issue token grants. Um, so a little bit different. Everybody's oh. high. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's hard to get your, your mind around if you come from traditional tech or even other web three companies where you have the idea of equity, this is an, an actual sort of piece of the pie, right? It's actual liquid, um, you know, currency, those things, especially once you vest, I won't bore you with all those details. Um, but it's, it's a bit of a game changer when you're talking through negotiations and sort of total compensation packages, um, mm -hmm. a bit more a unique approach um, than what you see in other spaces. Absolutely. It's super frustrating waiting for a company to take seven to at times 12 to 15 years to exit and see anything meaningful. Right. Um, so yeah, you're right. If someone, someone can kind of exit within a year, if they, if right. they, if they want the heck hash or want to remove a little bit of volatility from their risk profile. Exactly. And you don't oftentimes have a lot of control over when that happens, right? As much as you believe in the product and the, the organization you're working with, you're sort of tied to whatever their decisions are, whether it's to sell, to go public, to whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? But with when you're getting tokens, you know, once you you vest and you recognize those, they're yours to make those decisions and you can get, again, a little bit more creative. Um, yeah. That's super interesting. And without giving too much away, is there like a ballpark of what you've noticed that people have joined your organization in terms of like 20% of people said yes to taking part of their compensation in, in, uh, in tokens yeah. versus like 80% were like, no, nah, I just want that cold, cold, yeah, cold so over cash. 
It's interesting. This is a conversation we're having right now because I think the Web3 mm -hmm. space has changed. I know we'll get into some of those questions here in a little bit, but yeah. a year ago, the numbers were closer to about 90% of the folks joining were taking a majority of theirs in tokens, right? Uh, Just uh, over meaning over 50% of their annual compensation yes. was yeah. in tokens. Mm -hmm. Wow. And okay. That shifted. Um, I think folks are just a little bit less risk tolerant now, given current climates, those things, but it would still sit right around the 50% mark. Um, in fact, it's a question that comes up even in initial screens with candidates. Um, mm -hmm. They're very curious about those pieces even. So sometimes they beat yeah. us to the pinch on that. Um, it's typically not us selling them on that idea. It's just figuring out what's going to work best, but um, it's, it's a big piece for us. That's fascinating. That's way higher than I would have imagined, yeah. especially if you're not really saying, oh, you don't get this job unless you take partially. It doesn't sound like you're doing that. You're giving people oh, the gosh, option. No. Yeah, absolutely. And which is when yeah. we're recruiting, we give people the opportunities like, you know, here's a variety of offers for you to take with with different levels of risk tolerance, yep. choose what's best for you. Um, so that that's fascinating. I don't know, Aaron, if you've kind of come across that or if it's sort of I, I, I don't know if Coindesk does that or anything like that. You've talked to organizations and learned a yeah, little bit no. of that as well. Um, we do have a partner um, that actually uh, helps us pay people in cryptocurrency direct to their uh, their Coinbase accounts. But wow. actually, one thing that I sort of think about, um, you know, a, as we move into Web three and and the metaverse, and um, I like to think a lot about security. And one one use case where I see tokenization being really useful, um, and I haven't quite found the organization that's doing it yet. But, um, you know, we have here at Coindesk a lot of freelance contributors who, you know, have one-off payments, um, you know, several times throughout the year. They also work with uh, other clients. Um, so these are people that could be putting out hundreds of invoices a year. Um, and if they could tokenize and, and keep uh, their payments secure without putting, you know, their social security number out there or their banking information, um, you know, it, uh, number one, it streamlines it and it keeps their personal information very secure. And I think um, that's something that you might see in the future. That's really interesting as well. Yeah, you would think that people who took Bitcoin as compensation, I remember there was news around maybe a year or two ago, some football players, I think it was the, the number one pick in the draft, Trevor Lawrence, like a year ago, took like a big per percentage of his compensation as Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm curious how, how that's going for him. I don't know exactly what price he got in at, but I'm wondering if he's sort of like, oh, wow. But I'm, I'd imagine maybe a maybe an athlete or someone else right now would be like, yeah, it's it's, it's at a discount. Um, but there's also a lot of risk. It's not sort of this idea that it's just going to like perpetually go up and up and up. Um, so that that that's really fascinating. And it's also fascinating that now you have that that sort of uh, verbiage to say, hey, this this is all at a discount right now. You know, look at the prices where they were at a year or two ago. Um, but that risk tolerance in people has gone down a little bit, even though that they can get a higher risk reward on it. That's fascinating. Cool. Um, let's jump into a different question. Um, yeah. What tips do you have for founders and investors when 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 hiring? Um, I think I've talked about this a little bit with each of you in terms of like, you know, with, there there were specific things that everyone was looking for in Web two companies, and what's kind of different for Web three. Um, are there any specific things that you're looking for, or anecdotes of how you might you know, reach out to people a little bit differently or interview a little bit differently, specific questions you might ask. Um, yeah, I would love to know like any tips for, for founders or investors. Number one, like who, also like, are you looking for a different profile um, than, than your traditional kind of like web to tech company? Um, yeah, I would love to hear any anecdotes and learnings um, since I'm sure you've all had like great successes and, you know, maybe some, some times where it ended up being learning experiences. Anyone feel free to go. <laughs> sure, we can, uh, I'll start. Maybe we'll go in the same order. Um, so I, I I think the greatest learning piece for us is, uh, and I think this happens with every major uh, shift in technology, um, hiring for roles in Web3 is almost exactly the same as hiring for the roles um, in Web2 or Web1, uh, if you want to think okay. of it that way. Um, and maybe it's just helpful to, you know, when we say the Web3 space, I don't know that people fully understand what we're talking about, but at least our framework for how we think about it is Web1 was, you know, you can just read on the internet. You can look at cat memes and look at Yahoo, but it was just a directory. 
Um, and web two was, you know, sort of the advent of user generated content. We now had to be social and everyone had social profiles and your candidates and employers were interacting with their team. You got things like Glassdoor now where people can leave like reviews for companies or uh, leave, leave feedback on their American Airlines flight. And American Airlines actually has to engage now and tweet back about their apology for your poor travel experience. Uh, and Web3 takes us into a point of the internet where it's the read, the write, and the own, where users are now stakeholders. And they're really involved. Um, they're really involved in some cases in like the governance of the various different apps, tools, and protocols uh, that they're working in. And the same is true for employees. So it does change the dynamic in some ways, but by and large, how you go about, for example, I think, you know, Anish, this goes to like your background, how you go about acquiring new users, fundamentally, that's still largely the same, right? If you look at how you acquired a user for a web two platform, there's a cost of customer acquisition. There's uh, an expected lifetime value of that particular user. Um, and there's gonna be some churn. There'll be some churn related to like how long that user stays there and recruiting a person to focus on growth in web three typically takes the same skill set of a performance marketer in web two, who still knows how to do that. You're just, in some cases, just introducing the concept of token economics with it. So it requires you to have someone that's open-minded enough that they can say, okay, great. I've got this fundamental skill set in like, you know, again, to keep the growth marketer role um, with SEO, with performance acquisition, um, that they can manage paid um, or that they can manage an influencer campaign and they can track how those campaigns are functioning. But maybe instead of it being a CAC cost that's paid in dollars, in some cases, these protocols will lure you with token bounties uh, or like, hey, each one of our new users gets airdropped a certain amount of tokens, but fundamentally the actual activities still haven't changed. You still need people to promote, come use this platform or come be a developer in our ecosystem. Um, and it's still largely the same skill set. So I think where we have done poorly in hiring in the past. We've kind of looked for people who we figured were like, hey, these are just pure Web3 believers. They're really all in on Web3. We like them, even though they may have lacked some of our like desired fundamental skills. And then where we've learned quickly is, wait a minute, slow down. We actually don't even require you to have any Web3 experience at all for many of our roles. You're a really good developer. If you're a really good developer and you've got experience with, you know, JS and uh, you know you understand you know, you've worked. I'm just giving Python Django in the past, and you've built you know application stacks using pretty modern or relevant technologies. It's pretty easy for you to come and pick up something like uh, development around uh, development around blockchain or the growth marketing tactics that were needed again in a traditional SaaS company are pretty much still for us very much the same. So we actually have stopped looking for. My advice would be stop recruiting people or restricting your talent pool to just people who have previously come from a Web3 company because that talent pool was small, still is small, but is growing. There are amazing people who are growth marketers at traditional businesses that we are seeing profiles and issue have helped us look at some of them that are uh, we are attracted to. And it's okay for me that they don't yet, that they may not be believers or that they may not get it. That can come later. Um, we, uh, we're, 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 we're just less likely to push for that as a, a prereq up front. So my advice to other founders in the space is don't have that be a prereq. Uh, don't limit yourself to just people who, um, are working in blockchain today. That's great advice. And it's interesting because it, it goes against some of like the, what I've heard from some of the other people who've been hiring in this space. So I love seeing different perspectives and storylines where I was talking to someone else who is is doing a lot of content around hiring within the space. And, you know, they were basically saying the right questions to ask in interview is like, what DAOs are you a part of? What NFTs do you own? And I love hearing your experiences of being like, I went down that path. Actually, it's less it's less important than than having someone who's just functionally good at their at yeah. Their, I want to let I want to let Aaron I want to let Aaron and Courtney talk, but just to like highlight yeah. what you just said, Anish, only nine million people in the world have ever purchased an NFT. 
So it's like mm. limiting yourself to that talent pool is outrageous. It's like Fair. everybody will own an NFT right now. And one day that'll be hundreds of millions of people, but like, we're not going to hold it against a candidate that they don't have an NFT portfolio right now. Frankly, if you had one, it's probably underwater and it was really bad that you had one in the first place and you probably <laughs> bought it during the period of rational exuberance. So let's be patient with people. And, you know, it's, there are no bad employees, it's bad managers. It's our job to educate people on what this space is and mm -hmm. uh, to do that. So just don't limit yourself to people already in the, in our world. Amazing. Yeah. Aaron Courtney, I'd love to hear, hear some of your thoughts as well. And like sort of what you're looking for when you're out there kind of sourcing for the best talent for your organizations, any specific things that you, when you're talking to them, you're like, Oh, this is why someone might be a great fit here versus, uh, versus maybe not the best fit for this exact company. I'm big on the, the why web three, you're not going to find folks similar to what Jordan's saying, who likely came from another protocol company, came from another web three. Mm -hmm. This just isn't that big yet, but I do think there's a huge advantage if you have somebody who's web curious, right. Or at least mm -hmm. understands web three, it's really difficult to convince a really talented developer to see the value in your NFT project or to see the value in your, your protocol. But if you have somebody who maybe dabbles in trading a little bit or, or bought an NFT when things are really exciting and, and when they're interested in, I think that's a really big sort of signal that while you may have that lack that traditional experience in Web3 that again, not many people have, it's a very new space um, that at least tells me you see the value, right? Or you, you see the utility in the space and the things you can do. That's a big thing for us. The other thing I, I always sort of comment on, and, and this was big um, in previous roles was relying on your community, right? You likely have really talented folks in your community who are just commenting on your NFT project or commenting on um, one of your tokens who hasn't really sort of fully exposed themselves as somebody who, who wants to do it. Um, but I think not enough companies um, utilize the folks who are already excited about their products um, and who are, are active in their community to do those things. If you are not recruiting again within your community or leveraging your community for those things, I think that's a big mess. That's a, a bit of a change. And that's not like a social platform, like, oh, are you sharing my LinkedIn post? No, mm -hmm. it, that's deep in the discord, right? Doing those kinds of things um, would be one thing I would advise founders of beyond obviously having um, a little bit more of an open mind around the candidate you're looking for. Makes sense. Yeah. I think all of those are, are good points. Um, what I would say is, um, to Jordan's point, um, the, the industry is still relatively small. Um, there's a lot of people in DAOs um, that are working on projects that are not being paid for their work. Um, it's simply, you know, I guess, volunteerism, and they want to be part of the community. And I think um, you have to look sort of deeper into those um, projects that you might see on resumes or something someone's dabbling with that they put on their LinkedIn profile um, that might be applicable to what you're trying to do within your organization. Okay. Like, like are there certain things that pop out to you of like, oh, like, you, you know, this person didn't work at a company that's super similar to ours. Here's a couple things that popped out to me uh, from their profile that made me think, okay, I think they, they'd be, they, they would resonate with what yep, we're absolutely. offering, what we offer would resonate and they, they would maybe do well here. Uh, when I was looking for someone um, to fill a social role, um, I, I was deep looking for someone who had either started some uh, discord communities or was extremely active. Um, and you can find a lot of those people who are super passionate, they're extremely active, um, and they've built communities, um, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people large just year uh, by facilitating great content um, and, and engaging a community. Um, so that's one of the things we looked for as we started to grow our Discord community. Um, but again, um, there's so many projects out there that technically aren't funded, um, but that people are really working hard to get investors. Um, and I think that that is relative and that is real work experience, especially in this industry. That's great. Thanks for all of your, all of your thoughts here. Um, cool. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, yeah. When you are talking to candidates, is there anything that when you're pitching them about your products that like you see their eyes light up? Uh, and sort of like, oh, I can really, maybe when, if they were a skeptic, once you start sort of talking to them about something, they're like, oh yeah, wait, no, this could actually really work well for me, whether it's the future prospects, whether it's doing something on the cusp of, of technology, um, and of innovation or something really specific about the day-to-day -day that, that might be interesting, like a technical challenge. Um, you know, what would have all you noticed that, you know, founders could utilize what, when they're pitching in terms of your learnings. 
Yeah, I think if you look at the market right now, um, it is there. I think there were a lot of people that accepted jobs in the space that are um, at least what we have seen are uh, for either reasons out of their control, like, you know, Celsius, mm -hmm. Voyager, Three Arrows are unfortunately looking for other roles um, or their stock options are underwater because of 80, 90 percent corrections sort of across both tech equity and then crypto valuations, you know, market caps of certain protocols, if you ended up at one of those are, you know, probably less than what you expected when you joined. Um, there's a lot of people looking to make a move and looking to make a role. When we're talking to net new people, looking to convince them out there, I think taking a more sober approach, you know, selling them on all the exuberance on this is the future. Everybody's going to be using NFTs as title deeds to properties and authenticity certificates of watches. And, you know, um, uh, you know, we're going to spend more. Actually, I heard a really fun definition of the metaverse recently that the metaverse is not actually a destination. It describes a point in time um, mm. where, uh, our digital lives are more valuable to us than our in real life lives, where you spend more money on your clothes for your avatar walking down the street than you do in your like daily wardrobe. And you could see that world. It's like not too far off and talking to candidates about that. I think in the past was exciting. I would just now what we've done and how those conversations have shifted is there's still a lot of interest. There's still a lot of people looking to come work in crypto. Um, and I consider this is, uh, it's very different than it was hiring in 2016 and 2017 in this space. This is, um, but we talk about the data a lot more. So if you just look at the data, uh, it would seem to reason, and you can get this on like Dune analytics or just some other open source tools. It looks like we're roughly 300, uh, by best guesses, we're 300 million global users or 350 million global users of public blockchain networks uh, that have accounts on public blockchains. Um, if you map the curve on how we got here, our adoption clip is faster, uh, shouldn't be surprising, but it's faster than the adoption of the modern high-speed internet. So we're growing at a clip faster than that. And at the current growth trajectory, we'll pass a billion users of public blockchain networks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, et cetera. We'll pass that by uh, 20 to, right now it says 2024 to 2025, somewhere in that time frame, which is a massive, significant number, right? And then you apply that to other places in the space. Obviously, we are interested in NFTs. We're building in, in the NFT space. Only 10 million users today. I think that 10% of all global blockchain users in 2024, 2025 will be in the NFT space. That's 100 million plus NFT users. That's that's what excites us. When we're trying to talk rationally or unemotionally to candidates, we want to we want them to appreciate what we see as still a very exciting growth sector, a very exciting growth opportunity. And you know, it is scary joining a space where Bitcoin has gone from twenty thousand to three thousand, or a thousand to two hundred, or now sixty nine thousand to uh, you know wherever we are today, twenty thousand. Right. So it's like you know, talking Canada into that. It's okay. Let's move the emotion of the exuberance has gone away. NFT volumes have ninety eight percent corrected. Literally, we're down ninety eight percent daily daily volume in the NFT world. Why does this still matter? Um, and much like it mattered when Bitcoin came back because enterprise and institutional adoption of blockchain tech, I think really propelled us um, and people really understanding Bitcoin as a digital store of value, sort of the gold 2.0 meme narrative caught on. I think we're now starting to see, okay, the exuberance has gone away. There's real adoption. Enterprises are trying to figure out how to use NFTs. You see it with Nike's acquisition of Artifact and all the big players are is really just formalizing what they're going to be doing in the space. Ticketmaster's got a deal with Flow. You can read the news. You don't need me to tell it to you. So it's <laughs> what are the what are the uh, sort of uh, what are those data points? Sharing them with candidates. That's probably the least exciting way to pitch a candidate, but is the one that's working for us right now the most. Which is don't worry about the prices day to day. Your parents are going to think you're crazy. Don't worry. I've been there too. My dad thought I was crazy when I didn't sell my Bitcoin at 20,000, it dropped to 3000. And for a while I thought I was crazy too, but we're here for the long run. We're building for the long run. Uh, and that, I think that excites candidates the most. It's a bit more of a sober take on how to approach them. I mean, scale and TAM is, is, and future TAM is, is 
is massively appealing to show that you've thought through it, you know where the industry is going. And hey, if more and more users are getting on there, there must be more monetization opportunities and opportunities for real businesses to to function. So yeah, I think it's great leading with leading with the with the numbers now and the future. Will, yeah. will you get there? Will there be bumps in the road? Absolutely. But um it's kind of what you sign up for. Um yeah. Cool. Any, any, um, I'd love to learn kind of how you've been talking to candidates and if there's been anything that's been exciting when you, when you've talked to them, you Courtney or, and, and, or, uh, Aaron. Aaron, do you want to go? I always go ahead of you. <laughs> okay. yeah, sure. No, for me, um, I, I guess I'm the realist. I like to think about real world application of, of mm -hmm. things. And, um, you know, when I think about my blue wallet, right. And, and the possibility that, um, you know, I can make a payment on something and I never have to worry about someone stealing my credit card information or, um, you know, not really ever having to go to the gym again and, and doing, um, you know, workouts with my trainer, um, you know, with a headset on and, and in the metaverse and, you know, all of a sudden I'm, you know, working out in New Zealand. Um, you know, I think while, while those things might seem far off, um, they're really actually very close. And, um, you know, I, I think um, for me, it's, you know, to, again, to Jordan's point about living fully in the metaverse and, and dressing your avatar. I don't know that, um, I don't know that, that that's exciting for everyone, um, but I do see um, practical application for all of these things. And, um, you know, I think enticing and figuring out what interests a candidate and, and what may, might drive their engagement. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I love that, that, that final point there. I mean, anytime we're interviewing someone who's really fantastic and has a fan, has a great background, worked at all the right places, you can tell that they've done well in their career. The, you know, one of the earliest questions I ask before even pitching them anything, maybe it's different because we're, we're, we're a search firm and we obviously work across lots of clients. So we have multiple directions we can put, push people in, but yeah, even just really quickly asking, what is it that excites you and about the next thing? And what is it that about your previous roles that you're looking, um, you know, to get something more exciting out of with your next role? Which is a nice way of kind of kind of getting them to sl slightly bash their previous company, but you also kind of learn like, oh, what is it that I mean that what is it that your last role didn't give you enough of, and then you know what exactly you know you can pitch them that that, that you're able to do. So really letting the person talk, and then you know if they're like, you know what, I just want to take a risk in my career. Great. Well, let me talk to you about this, or you know, I want something exciting but still kind of safe. Um, well, you know, we've got some of that as well. We've got runway till 2025. We've, you know, all those things. So it, it, it's really, a, it's, it really allows you to pitch the right portion, you know, and any great person doing recruiting has to have a wide variety of bullet points of things you can talk about and why, why someone might be interested, you know, in terms of the, the, the UVP of the company, the role, the function, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, that that's a really great point. And there's so many angles you can go in with web three that, um, you know, yeah, letting someone talk first is the best way to do it. For sure. I think an understanding to what 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 part of Web3 are they joining, right? We, we've talked a lot about NFTs. There's decentralization. There's cryptocurrencies. There's all these different pieces. And typically somebody who's excited about the decentralization isn't going to be as excited about NFTs, right? And so understanding where mm -hmm. you can hit home the exciting portions of all of those will help, I think, get across um, your product, your mission better with the candidate, if that makes sense. Origin has an NFT piece and a decentralization, you know, tokens, those things. So depending on what role you're playing for the team will depend on what it is the candidate's going to find exciting, but you do make a good yeah. point around. I always like to start with, you know, why Web3? Why are you excited? Especially if, if you're getting in for the first time and you can understand where they see value, right? There are so many different avenues to go down so many different things. Who am I to tell you what the most exciting part of it is, right? I can certainly share what that is, but as a people person, as a recruiter, I always like to ask that question and understand what that is and then highlight how it is we further that mission for them, right? With what mm -hmm. they're working on or maybe sharing about things we have in the future that they haven't thought about. But I do think that there's still a lot of excitement in this space. And while it's not the hype train it was a year ago, there's a lot of really cool things happening and things that you can appreciate whether or not you believe your avatar is going to wear Gucci shoes, right? Or you're going to, uh, you know, be able to purchase your house on Amazon with Bitcoin in the next year. 
there's, there's access folks in, in third world countries able to access things. So there's an extra layer of security with smart contracts. There's all of these parts of our normal lives that are going to be impacted by things that are in web three. I think people who aren't from the space automatically think NFTs and have seen what happened there and then think crypto and that's down and fail to realize that that's just the, the top layer of it all. Right. And don't deep dive into everything that is web three and what web three could be. Right. I oftentimes will end conversations with, and, and this is just the beginning, right? It really is. Yeah. Where right at the starting out point of what could happen. Um, but I really like to just do that sort of real world application ways in your everyday life. You are likely to interact with a Web3 technology in the coming days. If not, you already do it and don't realize that the Starbucks one is a really good example, right? They shared that they're not even going to say that those are NFTs, right? They're going to put their loyalty program into this technology with Polygon, and they're not even going to mention that it's an NFT. They're going to onboard all of these users who won't even understand the technology they're harnessing and what they're doing, which is sort of an interesting piece there, right? But it's sort of that mass adoption um, that I think gets people sort of thinking, right, and stirring. Um, yeah. Most of our folks are just excited about, you know, sort of the opportunity to build something new and, and have a say in, in where we go with it. Yeah, I, th I think that's exciting. I think there's two things that I, I pulled across what both, all three of you were saying um, when you're talking to Canada debates about why they should, why they could potentially be excited. Number one, real world applications. Um, I think all three of you kind of touched upon that. Um, uh, and then number two, kind of the, the future scale and that this is just going to touch so many lives and you'll be able to build things that touch so many people's lives, um, which are both really exciting. And, and what neither of you talked about was sort of the gambling aspect, which, which got people really excited about, uh, you know, Bitcoin and NFTs, you know, a couple of years ago, like, oh, by the way, people are putting $400 into this NFT and pulling out, you know, $4,000. Don't you want to be a part of that? And, and I think that's obviously died as, as the gambling aspect of, of all of this is sort of sort of died down a little bit as well. Um, and it's probably a good thing that people aren't just jumping into it strictly to like get some quick money. Cool. Let's jump to the next one. Uh, Jordan touched upon this a little bit, but, um, you know, all three of you are part of platforms that are scaling as much as possible and trying to reach as many audiences and probably a majority of the audiences you're trying to reach are a little bit new to, 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 to these worlds and aren't necessarily experts, aren't necessarily, you know, reading up on it day, day to day. And, and so like you, you have to kind of educate new audiences on why they could potentially be, be exciting and interesting here. So would love to learn, um, you know, some ways that you've been thinking about, about that, like just to get into more and more, yeah, just to get in front of more and more people who maybe are on the fence about uh, whether they should be interested in joining some of your, I, I would say either on the recruiting side, like getting in front of them or even just users um, and, and how you've been growing and growing there. I know Coindesk has done an amazing job of like having that content be really relevant for people who are, you know, massive enthusiasts, but also, you know, people who are just getting their, their, their feet wet, just kind of want to learn. Um, but yeah, we'd love to learn any tips and learnings from there. Yeah, I can I can take that one um, first. Um, yeah, we've done a lot of content, especially on social, um, around uh, getting a role, networking in, in Web3. Um, I think for me, um, I look at a lot of soft skills, right? Um, none of us are subject matter experts, except for maybe Jordan on this call, who has been in the space since very early on. Um, but we all have more to learn. Uh, we all have more to grow. Um, there constantly are more avenues with which to do that. Um, I, this week, was introduced to yet another uh, knowledge uh, metaverse platform that, um, you know, someone's starting up. So um, there's all sorts of avenues out there. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of Discord channels that anyone can be a part of. Um, I just think that for me, um, you're not going to know everything, but I think, you know, Courtney really said it well, if someone has passion around the space and wants to grow and wants to learn, um, and you can see this innate curiosity um, and the desire to learn and, and to go to classes, to join webinars, um, to be a part of communities, to go to meetups, um, and do anything they can um, to gain the knowledge, um, then I think, you know, they absolutely deserve a shot. 
Um, soft skills are just as important and sometimes more important um, than hard skills. You can go to a coding class and, and you know, learn how to code in, in six weeks if you really want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but innate curiosity and innate um, and innately wanting to be a lifelong learner is, is not something you can teach. That's great. And yeah, and then when, when we're doing, let's say, you know, CMO roles or, you know, chief growth officer roles for, for, for more traditional web two tech companies, you know, the thing we hear often is we want someone who's seen it and done it at least once or twice and wants to do it again. Right. We, we hear that a lot, but a good luck finding someone who's done that, you know, within these particular industries, they have to have the ability to learn and not show up with a playbook. So I think, I think that's, that's a really great tip right there. The soft skills are huge, right? The ability to communicate. One of the other things that's, that's really, I think sets it apart from web two, traditional web two is, is web three companies that are intentionally distributed workforces, right? So they have, have folks all over the globe. You've got teams that are required to use really good communication skills. You've got to be able to talk to somebody on discord. You're not going to have these sort of in-person coding, you know, sort of brainstorming events. You have to have those soft skills to be able to communicate, but I think it take it a step further. You really have to have somebody who, who similar to what Aaron's saying, curious and wants to be there, right? Wants to be a part of it, wants to learn. Uh, you know, we say the word scrappy a lot, right? Somebody's got to be scrappy. A lot of these companies are a lot smaller as well. Majority of, of Web3 companies, right, are about less than 100 people. You've got to wear a lot of different hats, be willing to learn, take things on and pivot, right? We, we all took a huge pivot, um, you know, earlier this year when things were, were smooth sailing. And then all of a sudden you've got to quickly react to what the market is telling you. And so you don't have some of the luxuries to understand, okay, what did what did we do a year ago when this happened? Well, it didn't happen to us a year ago because we weren't here a year ago, right? Or sure. it look like that a year ago. Yeah. So folks who, who are willing to do that and accept that, and that can be a struggle. I, I've said before, I would rather have somebody who um, knows a lot about a little or a little about a lot, right? I'm going to get that that confused. But somebody who's wore a lot of different hats is, is really helpful, right? Somebody who comes in and says, I need a playbook on X, Y, and Z. I tell them you're five years too early for us, right? We'll see you in five years. We're not there yet. That's just not who we are. And I think that's a fair mm-hmm. assessment for candidates coming in, but for who we are right now. And I think a lot of web companies, web three companies are that way. Um, but yeah, that, that curiosity, that, that willing to learn and willing to jump in and get your hands dirty, whether you are the CMO or you are an individual contributor, whoever it is, um, is likely somebody who's going to be excited and happy in, in web three for who they are today. Um, but you, you have to be able to look past those things um, as you're recruiting and bringing talent in you're not likely to find someone that checks all those boxes that's fair cool um yeah so i think the big thing i took away from that is you know it's not going to be like a lot of the companies that we're working with right now who are they're sort of just like get us someone who's worked at the exact same type of company for the last like five to ten years whether it's marketplaces whether it's SaaS, whether it's you know e-com slash g2c it's no just get us someone who really has the great soft and hard skills but soft skills probably being even more because they have they have the want to learn uh, on the job versus you know being expected to know what they're doing already and unro- unraveling a playbook so that's really great um let's jump to the next one interesting um obviously like it sounds like a lot of the recruiting is similar to web 2 and that you're hiring functional roles um but what are kind of the roles that you're seeing companies needing as much as possible of, you know, is a classic tech companies where you just need lots and lots of engineers. And that's kind of the, like the, like where, where are your hiring bottlenecks right now that you're sort of like, Oh, wow, we really need people who are skilled in these particular areas. And we're sort of behind in. So I think it depends on what you're doing, right? Uh, for mm-hmm. us, obviously a protocol company, I'll speak to that first, but solidity is huge for us. It's, it's newer on sort of on the street. It's um, it goes directly to those smart contracts. Folks are able to build, you know, sort of complex pieces on the back end, but it's a newer technology and not as many people have it. And almost every single web three company is looking for it. Right. And so what we're mm-hmm. seeing for senior solidity engineers is now like two to four years of experience, right. As before, when you were looking for senior full stack, it was, Oh, somebody eight years has run a team, whatever. So sort of interesting to see the dynamic there because it's, it's so new. Um, that's yeah. big for us. And we're finding a lot of folks who do it as a pet project. That's a good example of where hiring in web three is different than hiring in web two, where we're checking out people's GitHubs, checking out their, their projects. They may not do it for their full-time job, right. But they're contributing to other people's repositories, those things. Um, and are using that as a great example of somebody to join us, but that that's a huge thing for us on the, the, the protocol side. And then just 
folks with really great on the NFT side of the house, really great like digital vis visualization skills, the ability to do like um, 3D movement, all of those as NFTs have gone from just sort of flat 2D pictures into something a bit more um, exaggerated and more creative. Um, but for us, definitely um, Solidity. So if any of you know Solidity engineers, uh, <laughs> uh, very much happy to chat with them about that. Uh, but that's Amazing. a big need for us. And I know a number of other folks. So when, when you're thinking about interviewing people who have that Solidity experience, would someone with, let's say, 10 years of development experience across other languages, and then that two years of Solidity experience really, really be a lot more exciting for you than, let's say, someone just got out of university and they just started coding coding in Solidity right after they got out, and they really have two years of experience, you know, um, like, would, would, would those would, would both of those candidates just feel equivalent and exciting to you because they've been doing it for two years? Um, uh, and may, maybe this is a cheat code for someone getting out of college right now and how to like get ahead and, and match some of the more senior developer, you know, candidates. So I think in terms of Solidity experience, yeah, those folks maybe looked at, you know, relatively similar for the role. This is a very sort of narrow scoped, you know, sort of answer about for the role mm -hmm. we're looking to let somebody to sort of elevate up, lead a team. We would like somebody with those 10 years of development sure. experience who's, you know, sort of troubles, done troubleshooting, testing, all those things. But yeah, if I was looking for a solid solidity engineer, yeah, somebody with two years of solid experience, whether they're just out or don't even have an education, right? To Jordan's point mm -hmm. there. Um, we would absolutely look at them, right? It's the quality of their code is what I'm looking at, less around um, the checkboxes you check off on what would be a traditional sort of web two hiring sheet, right? I, I'm going to look at that uh, much closer than I'm going to look at what school you went from or or where else you worked. Those are great building blocks, good foundational pieces. Um, but again, somebody who's got, got some pretty deep code, pretty deep solidity would be somebody we would look at. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, Aaron, any thoughts on sort of where where, where you're sort of focusing a lot of your hiring right now um, or in, in the recent past, and it just feels like a bottleneck for you. Yeah, for me, um, I'm not doing much uh, engineering stuff right now. We are obviously a media company, so we're not really building a, a sort of metaverse product or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, Which is why I'm excited about your perspective, yeah. Yeah, um, actually, my my significant other is a software engineer, um, and I'm always curious to hear what he's seeing in the market. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, actually I have a very good friend that works at Meta, um, as well. Um, and they're deep into the, into building it. Um, but I've seen a lot of unity, um, unity is a, is a language, um, mostly focused on, on your, you know, your 3d. So that's, what's going to be, um, building the metaverse. Um, and, and it's huge in gaming right now. Um, I was doing some research over the past week. I think every single gaming company is looking for, uh, unity engineers. Um, so that's something, um, Coindesk, we're actually, um, continuing to build, um, and, and hopefully continue to evangelize our token. Um, uh, basically we, you know, we've used it at consensus, um, uh, a little bit. Um, we did a drop uh, right before uh, people were able to use it um, to to buy snacks and and you know to buy some unique swag and things like that. And um, you know we're continuing to think about how can we how can we use it in other places. Um, we just did a hackathon and and hopefully we came up with some really great ideas. Um, so again, going back to tokenization, um, I'm always curious to hear about anyone who has, um, any thoughts on that or, or any use cases, um, anyone in product, um, that, you know, has touched on that a little bit. Um, I'm really happy to chat with. Cool. So uh, of the different functions that are out there, is product kind of the one that you're sort of, you yourself are sort of searching the most for and ask, because maybe there's some people listening in here who sort of like, uh, you know, might know someone who might want to work within one of your roles that you're searching for these days? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, it's something I'm focused on right now, but again, across our businesses, uh, we have obviously Coindesk Television. So uh, any subject matter mm -hmm. experts across Web3, uh, I'm always happy to chat with. Um, and of course, writing, because that's sort of our largest, our largest product base. Um, Makes sense. But also, um, you know, we you know, our large, um, conferences, uh, again, um, anyone who's interested in, in, you know, speaking on our panels, um, we'd always love to chat with as well. 
it's interesting you mentioned the conferences. I'd imagine event production being really popular in Web3, considering the Web3 events have become like, <laughs> I, I, like I don't want to say ridiculous, but like bordering on it uh, in, in terms of like how insane the scale is at some of these events and how expensive the performers are and, and, and et cetera. But that's probably a great cottage industry. <laughs> No, it, it's huge. Um, and a lot of Web3 and metaverse organizations um, and conferences do some really beautiful and amazing activations that really mm -hmm. inspire people. Um, so it's a huge, um, a huge platform for people to be able to demonstrate their products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for that. Uh, and Jordan, any thoughts of like, you know, folks that you're sort of just like, man, we just can't get enough of people with this background or it's a bottleneck for us right now because we really need to get a, get people who are really great within these particular areas. Yeah, I wouldn't, um, it, it, it's hard to just say one role. I agree with what Aaron and Courtney said. I mean, mm -hmm. Solidity people are great. Unity people are great, hard to find, very in demand. Uh, good people are very hard to find and in, in, in demand in general. So um, we, uh, we, we, we're just looking for great people across the board in every single role. Um, that extends growth and marketing, uh, business development and sales. Um, I, uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's a shortage of good people in the world. I think that, uh, um, we, we have demand literally for every single role cross function. I mean, even that's communications, it's business development, that's marketing, that's engineering. Um, and I think the best companies in the space will, will just sort of have demand. So I don't, I don't know that it's unique to one particular, uh, role or function for us right now, but, uh, we're always just looking for really great people. That would be uh, that would be my answer. I'll keep it. I'll keep it ambiguous. Perfect. Um, well, we're at time now, and I want to really thank uh, all of our panelists here, uh, Aaron, Courtney, and uh, Jordan. I don't know. I learned a ton today, and I, I would say I'm 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 a novice when it comes to the Web three world. So it's been super interesting to learn everything today. Um, and yeah, and to everyone listening in, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Anish, thank you for the Thanks. invite. Uh, thank Thanks, you. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye.